Welcome to the Play Inspire Unite podcast. I'm your host, Ben Rycroft. This podcast is meant to lift the curtain about what goes on at Ontario Soccer. Too often, people fundamentally don't understand who we are and the role that the provincial body plays in the game. We're hoping we can change a little bit of that. There will be interviews with staff to discuss what they do and what goes on and off the field. There will be interviews with those in our membership who continue to push the game forward and unite us around that passion. We're also going to speak to those who are occasionally not from soccer, but are here to inspire us. Today, our chat falls under that inspire portion, and we're joined by Nancy Spun. <laughs> I'm excited to be here and talk about millennials. So when I first met you, I, was, um, I couldn't believe anybody would be this positive all the time. Um, a little bit cynical, obviously, but as I got to know you, I saw that this was very genuine and that you were this positive all the time. You had an interesting experience, and I'm saying interesting in the context of um, you, you went through a cancer bout, you, uh, you got to better understand the force of positivity in your life. And you and I have talked about this previously, but I wonder if you can share that story about how you confronted that darkness and how it's led you to have an understanding of positivity in your life and how that drives you as a person. Hmm. Okay, so uh, short story, long story short, that I had the luxury... I, I grew up in a great household. I had a wonderful family. I had tons of love around me. I w was an athlete. I went to university. I had a great life. And I, I was running 50K a day. I had a great job and then all. I'm running 50K a week and I'm fit and I'm happy. I have the best job in the world. And all of a sudden I go to the doctor and I am diagnosed with cancer. So I've never had challenges like that before. And I was always what I thought was a pretty solid person. I was pretty confident. I knew my personal brand really well. And then I get sick and I was, and they expedite me through the process because it was pretty, it needed to be dealt with quick, pretty quickly. Yeah. And uh, I all of a sudden went from this, and I always, I, I always say like long blonde hair and great job and big budgets and big opportunity and really fit to I'm gray and I'm puffy and I'm standing on the street and everybody was calling me a man, like a dude, because I had, I looked like a boy and I was just, uh, it was, I, I didn't know who I was as gray and puffy. And um, it was a really interesting moment for me because I asked myself, who do I want to be? Who do I, who am I at my core? Mm -hmm. And it really, what, what evolved from this thinking was, I, I just, uh, what makes my heart sing is I really want to help people succeed. And from there, I went on a journey to finding what make my, made my heart sing. And it would be uh, little tidbits of awesome. So I was through the journey of fighting cancer. I, I couldn't find the light. And uh, it was the first time in my life, like I said, I had this beautiful life and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm very dark because the drugs and the pressure and everything and I was, it, I, I had tasted darkness and I, and I couldn't get from the darkness to the light. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I did it by, inst and I told you this, I did it by, instead of s big one big revelation, I actually got from the darkness to the light by little tidbits. You know, I'd find little tidbits. and. You know, when I say what makes my heart sing is I love helping people succeed, I love helping people, it's little tidbits. It's little, I'd look for little tidbits of awesome in the journey from darkness to light. And the little tidbits for me were, I'd let a bus in and the bus would flash me twice. And I'd be like, give me a moment of joy. It would just give me a moment of joy. Yeah. I'd help a kid get a job. And it gave me such joy. And so it was those little pieces. I realized that's what I want my brand to be. You have a choice to be angry or upset or just dis, dis, dis feeling disrespected or whatever, or you have a choice to be happy. And I choose to be happy. You have wake up in the, and this is how I coach my kids. You wake up in the morning, you have a choice. Option A, grumpy. Option A, happy. Right. So I've reinvented myself from, the, from nothing again and uh, I feel like you know this is what I'm here in this world to do is to bring sunshine. And so I think the message is very uh, attuned to what our Ontario soccer community is because we're talking about passion and people in this game they don't get into it because they think it's just something they'd like to do they came into it knowing they were passionate about soccer but a lot of times sort of the the the, the, the realities of moving a sport forward challenge them 
in ways that maybe they're not prepared to understand. And so negativity begins to creep in. So I think that, that positivity message, the little bits of awesome message is so important for our community to sort of pull out, like celebrate your little wins day to day. So it'll overall begin to sort of shift your perspective. And to pull it back into what we were talking about um, with our organization, with the millennials, understanding themselves better than most, they know their strengths, they know their weaknesses better than the other generations in some cases, and they tend to know what they need to get there. But as, as leaders, it's important for us to start listening to them and attuning our styles to them. If you take that top down, wagging your finger, being really aggressive with them, they're not going to listen and they're going to leave our organizations. And right now, all the coordinator positions, our millennials here, the, all of the coordinator positions in the club community are, are, are millennials. And so I, I wonder if you can sort of help share some of your understandings as how to lead those millennials, inspire them, and give our club leaders sort of tools to work with in that context. Okay, so I'll, closing the loop on the first part of it with uh, you have a choice. You can either get irritated and angry about situations or you can look at them as learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. So you're in sport. There's lots of passion. This is what Ontario soccer is all about. It's inspire and unite. But it's about play and it's about fun. And that's what we got to focus on. And sometimes we get caught up in the anger as opposed to like, let's look at this from a different lens. Let's reframe this. So coming to the millennials and how reframing and anger and all that, that how do you lead a millennial? You, how do you inspire a millennial? Is you engage, you ask, you learn together. And it's, it's, you know, it's rooted in respect. And, and respect is not demonstrated. And, and that actually ties back to some of what you don't see on the playing field is, you know, it's rooted in respect. Everybody should respect each other. Mm -hmm. And when you're leading, inspiring a generation of talent, like we see in the millennials, mm -hmm. then it is about tying to their you know, their, their intellect and respecting them and learning with them. It's not about telling, I, I, I share this, so I do performance DNA. Uh, I coach people and I use their performance DNA. Mm -hmm. And when I cover the names of the people at the top of the sheet, because you get a one pager, right? You get this one pager and it tells me your performance DNA. When I cover the names of the sheet and I have a boomer and I have a millennial or a Gen X and a millennial and you can't tell the difference intellectually they are equal you are equal so so looking at each other like that i may have 25 years of wisdom mm -hmm. but intellectually ben you and i are equal mm -hmm. and so how do you take that talent how do you nurture that talent mm -hmm. you look at it like this is a level playing field and we're both top performers so how can we learn from each other so in preparation for this i was reading a bunch of articles about what you're supposed to do for millennials and everyone's sort of got a solution nowadays but the, one of the themes I saw was flat management. And you can tell me if this is correct or not because you sort of have the data to understand that. The environment where a CEO can go to a coordinator or a manager and ask them what they think and adopt that idea. Whereas in non-flat management styles, um, the, those in the senior leadership sort of lose track of those in the coordinator st level simply because they're detached from the reality because they've been there 30 years, 40 years experience. They've been climbing the ladder, so to speak. So you tell me, is that is that where we need to be with a club community and an Ontario soccer community? Do we need to flatten the management style so that those who are just coming in, who have that boundless passion and energy can share their ideas with those who have got that experience level? Uh, is a flat management the solution? I'm not sure. With hierarchy, with structure, you need structure. Even millennials need structure. Actually, millennials need four walls more than anybody. But let them operate within those four walls. But you have to have, structure is about decision making, right? You have to have some structure in place so that you have a delineation of roles and responsibilities and you have some decision making trees, right? Yeah. However, it doesn't preclude you from including and leveraging the talent on the team. Just because I'm a CEO and uh, the other person is a coordinator doesn't, shouldn't preclude me from engaging them in the conversation. See, what the misperception is, is because you have a title of coordinator is because you don't have that 
that interest or that talent to engage in interesting conversations. When I was, uh, what, I was experimenting with a, different, a number of different solutions and how to engage the millennial generation when I led a team. And it wasn't just my team, but other people on the floor. And I started this, it was like this innovation think tank on Friday mornings. And I bought everybody coffee and I brought in breakfast and I encouraged everybody to come. And it was simply to do this, talk, intellectual connection, that's it. I have a problem, please help me solve this problem. So I, I teach these kids that are just starting out in their career how to collaborate, how to communicate, and how to think critically. And if you read the RBC report, those are the three things you need to do with the millennials right now, because those are the business skills that are the most important business skills that we need to learn. But giving them the opportunity, whether or not I'm Thornhill Soccer Club, and I have this pool of talent Invite them in for breakfast for an hour. Get them to solve the problems together. Mm -hmm. Because the interesting thing is when you open up that opportunity to have that dialogue, because they are so free of thinking, they are, they're not restricted in their thinking, it is beautiful what they are able to come up with. So engaging them at the intellectual level, giving them the opportunity to engage at the intellectual level is fantastic. So it really has nothing to do about structure. It has everything to do about opportunity to to actively connect. So when you were at that major Canadian corporation, where did what did you see as a result of that weekly sit down? What came out of it? Okay, so let's look at other data. There's two stats, number three stats actually. 76% of all people in jobs are unhappy. That means that less than a 25% actually like what they do. Number stat number one. Number two, uh, millennials tend to leave three times more often than non-millennials. So 11% is the regular attrition rate and millennials leave at about 35%. The last uh, data point is that typically in business, science says that we don't actually train people to be leaders until 10 years into their career. So, the, so by creating these little um, projects, and I call them projects because with millennials it's really good when you have a start and an end and you have clear four walls. Mm -hmm. So you have these little projects, Friday morning engagement sessions, and you put them in there and they come out with better collaboration, better communication, better critical thinking skills. That solves all of those problems. They leave less because they're more engaged, they feel valued, they can communicate more, which gives them a little bit more like a confidence to communicate to other people. It allows them to find their voice and you're training a pool of talented future leaders. Right. So they stayed, they were happier, and you're teaching them for the future. You're setting them up. So I still have these guys reaching out to me with respect and thanks and appreciation. And really, it cost me coffee and a few muffins and an hour every week just to respect. So in, on, that, on that respect angle, I, I think that there's a general, and this is not news, but this is a, there's a general misconception about millennials and you see it in the news constantly. They call them lazy, they call them inefficient or entitled, all of the things that are seemingly incorrect. Um, I'm also cognizant of the fact that I think millennials are hyper aware of this now or, or are aware of this entering into the workforce. And so for them, it's difficult because they're entering into a workforce where they are, they are cognizant of the preconceived notions about them. And so it's difficult for them to find their place because they're sort of walking on eggshells to an extent because they don't want to be perceived as that because they know that they're not that. But for them, how do they challenge their leadership? How do they, what do you suggest for them as individuals to communicate to the senior leadership when someone is presented with a problem and they know that the, the, the route that they're going probably isn't the right way? How do they frame their argument or point of view so that that senior leadership understands and gives them the confidence to sort of go ahead and say those things as they know them to be? Okay, so the first piece of the puzzle in that answer is you, you say reframe or frame. And here's the important thing. If you tell yourself enough that you are like this, you're gonna start to believe that you're like this. Myopic, lazy, self-centered, erratic, whatever that clarification or classification is, you're gonna to start to believe it. So millennials, the work that I do with millennials is reframing it for themselves first. 
The second piece of the puzzle in working with the millennial generation is getting them to find their voice. And how you do that is you provide psychologically safe environments. And those, that is key, particularly for the top down, I'm going to yell and tell you, mm -hmm. Uh, it, is cr it is critical that you provide those psychologically safe environments for them to actually find their voice. And then, as you, so there's a little bit of the leadership, but there's also a responsibility of the millennial. Millennial has to find their voice, and the millennial has to learn first to reframe their thinking about them so they believe in themselves. Mm -hmm. And then, ultimately, as they are approaching leadership, it really is, once you've actually once you've actually become your authentic you and you find out what your voice sounds like, mm -hmm. it gives yourself, it gives you more power. And it's not about power meaning it's like an arrogance. It's a power meaning it's a confidence. And all of those senior leaders are actually attracted to that level of confidence. They want that level of confidence. And in fact, Johnny has communicated that to me specifically. Mm -hmm. I like when they challenge me. He wants them to challenge me. Provide them with opportunities, like Johnny provides the millennials in this team with opportunities to actually voice their opinion. Now, one last piece. Here's the interesting thing that I, you have to work with, and this isn't just a millennial thing, but sometimes there might be circumstances that the uh, executive team or other people within the organization are creating that are unbeknownst to them. They're kind of putting a wall up. They're not even paying attention to the fact that they're putting that wall up. Mm -hmm. And um, having that millennial find their voice and have that confidence, and, and it, it actually just pushes through that wall to get to the person, because it has nothing to do with the millennial or it has nothing to do with the fact that they're a coordinator it has everything to do with, like, I didn't even realize some of these guys put their head down. They work so hard, they don't even realize that they've got their head down all day. Mm -hmm. And pushing them, proactively pushing them, respectful persistence mm -hmm. to lift their head, to have that conversation, that connection is, is key. So it's both sides. J Johnny being Johnny Misley, our, our chief executive officer, of course, um, you touched on personal brand and psychologically safe environments. I want to come back to personal brand in a sec, but psychologically safe environments. What does that look like in, say, a club community or, or otherwise? Describe what would be a psychologically safe environment for a millennial starting out to succeed in. So I'll, show you, I'll, I'll share with you what it sounds like, okay. and then I'll share with you what it might look like. Okay. So it sounds like, hi, hello. How was your day? It's nice to see you, Ben. As opposed to not looking up, barking orders. I, I mean, really, it's, it's, it sounds absolutely absurd that I actually have to explain it that way, but it is, it is kind of true that you get so busy that you don't even lift your head. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the guys, I worked in the club environment for 12 years. I get it. It's tough. And they, some of these parents are relentless. And there's constant problems raining down on you. Mm -hmm. But actually look at the generation that's come in to help you because they've got so much energy. They're so keen. And in fact, this is what I believe. I believe the club environment is one of the best environments to actually help people learn to find their way. Mm -hmm. so, so even just by lifting your head, saying hello, welcoming them in, because they're pretty, they're guarded. They're unsure of themselves. They haven't found their voice yet. Giving them that open door to help them find their voice. That's what it sounds like. Asking what questions. So there's one action item that they can do. Mm -hmm. Lift two action items. Lift their head and ask a what question. What do you love about the sport? And that allows these two people to connect. And then once that connection is made, then you can evolve into, hey, Ben, I'm the head of Thornhill Soccer. I want to help you. Mm -hmm. Second thing, what does it look like? So a lot of guys, a lot of sport guys. I've been sport as a female my entire freaking career. Mm -hmm. And a lot of guys tend to do this. Like they stand up and they make themselves big and they're really, really big in front of these. So you have a person who's brand new and they tend to shrink and make themselves small. And then you've got this gigantic person coming in the room, makes themselves even bigger. So it's like a work to level the conversation even physically. So connect intellectually and make sure that you don't intimidate physically. And then from the, the switch of that, 
on the personal brand side for millennials, how do you coach them to enter into that space and also make themselves big so that they're not shrinking from true. that environment? True, so true. So what are the things that you teach them in that, in that context? Okay, so uh, I teach hundreds of students every year and every single kid that comes into my class for the most part has a baseball cap on, eyes down, they look like this. A lot of the women, unfortunately, a lot of the, um, some of these kids like shrink, they shrink in their chairs. So if you watch Amy Cuddy's TED talk, she talks about like fake it till you become it, yeah. be big, make yourself big until you believe it. Yeah. Um, that's really what we work together on. And I started with this, it's a handshake. They walk in, I make them look me in the eye and I shake their hand and I tell them it's very nice to meet you. Or when they come back to the class, I tell them it's very nice to see you again. And I make them look at me in the eye and I t make them like communicate with me. That way, those simple little things, like I said, hi, how are you? Start with that, how simple that is. It's not to be patronizing, it's not to be patronizing to either the, the, the club world, because I get how busy it is, or the millennial generation that tends to have their kind of head down. I, I, wouldn't, I, I would say those two simple things, shaking their hand, welcoming, welcoming them, like I, I'm establishing a baseline, mm -hmm. and it is eyeball to eyeball, intellectually and physically. Mm -hmm. And here's the last piece. I set expectations right off the bat, every single class. I set expectations with the kids that I hire and train. I set expectations from everybody I work with here that my expectation, I'm not coming down to your level of schluffy. I'm not coming down to your level of shy. I'm gonna pull you by the bootstraps, but my expectation is you're gonna come up to here. And my expect, because I think you're great. So borrow my belief that I have in you. And that's the last piece of the puzzle, Ben. Just believe in these kids. Right. And if you believe in them, it gives them power, it gives them wings, it gives them mm -hmm. energy for life to find themselves. It's really quite rewarding. So let's, let's end on that, because I think that's really good messaging. For, for us, or as an organization, and as a community, how do you tell these kids not to shrink from their, their greatness, so to speak? Because th that's sort of what you're alluding to, is that like they're, they're afraid to be themselves to a certain extent until they're, they find their voice, until they find their confidence in who they are. How do you bring that out of them or how do you teach them so that they're not afraid to, to shrink from that, from, uh, from that greatness that's inside of each one of us and that passion as well? Test. You just gotta test your voice. You gotta find situations where you can test your voice. It could be Starbucks. It could be, look, I have a son, so shy, testing, putting him in environments. He puts himself in environments where it's just a, it's a safe little test. And then you push. Life is about unfailing your greatness is about per performance. How do you unlock your greatness? You put yourself in greater challenging, more challenging opportunities. Just a little bit. Doesn't mean you have to go from coordinator to CEO in a day. Mm -hmm. I'm talking like when I was sick and I was bold and I was embarrassed, my challenge was walking from my car to my office and closing the door. And I ran and I didn't want to even go to the bathroom because I didn't want people to see me. So I would push myself. Then I pushed myself out of my office to the coffee shop. And while I was walking to the coffee shop, it gave me a little bit more energy and positivity and I got a chick who said she was inspired by me, so it gave me even more energy. So test little psychologically safe environments where those little tests will add, like the tidbits of awesome, you go from a little bit of light and eventually it leads to a lot of light. You go to a little bit of confidence and eventually it leads to a whole bunch of confidence. I said we were gonna end on the last point. I think we're gonna end on this one. Um, if you could leave a message with both the millennials and with the club community and the club leaders, what would it be to inspire both of them or challenge both of them to, to find their, their greatness, individually and collectively? So, two things, two things. Easy, ask questions with curiosity. Ask questions for exploration and listen with curiosity. So when you ask questions for exploration, what does it sound like? They're what questions. What makes your heart sing? How, 
Mm, that's a how question. What do you love about your job? If you actually connect intellectually, then you connect at a deeper level. There's a level of respect there. Mm -hmm. Ask questions, listen with curiosity, and it opens up a world of joy, opportunity, friendship, respect, makes you feel good, makes the person who's working with you feel good. So if you just do two things, ask questions and listen with curiosity, it, it really does change your life. That's Nancy Spotton. You can connect with her on LinkedIn, uh, always sharing great little tidbits of information for leaders and millennials alike. And if you like what we're doing here, drop a like on this video. If you haven't already, subscribe and hit that notification bell. So every time we post a video, uh, you get it in your inbox. Until you join us next, we encourage you to play, inspire, and unite.